Of a very bitter war. Tell us about a bit about the war and and and, and Mobutu and the, a bit of the history, very briefly. Yeah. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of minerals there. And on my last trip in the Central African Republic, I was actually offered. Uh, so they found out the rebels found out that I was uh, I'd grown up in Dubai, and so they said, "Oh, Dubai, can you bring us an excavator?" And uh, if you bring us an excavator, and this this uh, for what I asked, and they said, "Well, this whole." hill we're standing on is full of gold. So if we will, you can have one side of the hill and you bring, up the, you bring us the excavator. This is how the Wagner group did deals, yeah? <laughs> exactly. So in the Central African Republic, there was only artisanal mining. And until only recently did the Russia's Wagner group, which is active in Ukraine, they've brought industrial mining to the Central African Republic and they're making you know, hundreds of millions of dollars apparently and you know, f using that to finance recruitment and weapons in the Central African Republic. But yeah, I mean briefly, the, the reason I went to Congo, I was studying math, I was at Yale uh, in the States and I'd come from India. Uh, for those who know, I'd done a year at IIT, I'd sort of done my JE exams and sort of done a year at IIT doing electrical engineering there. And I came to Yale, I did math and I was, uh, uh, in my junior year, I believe, and uh, I opened the New York Times at, in the lunch hall and opened the middle of the newspaper, bottom of the page, and there was a little article saying four million people back then, it's now five or six million, four million people had died in Congo. And it blew my mind. I didn't understand why this wasn't on the front page. And so one thing led to the next, and you know, I was paying my final bill uh, at university, and uh, the cashier was African. I asked her, where are you from? She said, Zaire, which is the old name for, uh, for Congo. Uh, and she had fled to the U.S. when Mobutu, the dictator who'd taken power, who'd ruled for about 32 years, he'd, he'd, his regime had fallen in 1997, and so her family had moved to the U.S. And so I said, oh, Congo, oh, Zaire, you know, Congo to the cashier. I said, I might go there. And she said, you stupid Yale kids, you can't even sign a check. I could steal all your money. You have no idea. You, go, you can't go to Congo. You get killed or robbed. And so and she had a second job on Chapel Street in New Haven at a, at a parking lot. So every evening I would go and hang out with her and buy her Dunkin' Donuts milkshakes. And in the end, I, uh, she said I could stay with her family. So that's how, <laughs> in Kinshasa. And so that was my ticket. I bought my ticket to Congo. And so that, that's how I ended up going. Yeah. And, and of course, I mean, uh, being a stringer is both extremely exhilarating but also exceptionally risky because there is no health insurance. Nobody's going to pay back your fare. You're writing. 100 words, 800 words, and you're paid sometimes, somewhere in some currency. And basically, it's shoestring, isn't it? Or worse? I mean, yeah, it, it is a precarious existence. So, uh, Stringer, the title of my first book, refers to a freelance journalist paid by the word. So I was paid 10 cents per word published, not per word I submitted. And uh, uh, I believe the word comes from, the term Stringer comes from uh, this practice where the editors would measure the length of a column using a string and decide how much you were to be paid. Uh, but yeah, there's no you know, health insurance, there's no... Uh, I remember when I, at the end of my time in Congo, I, I covered the elections in 2006. It was the first uh, free elections in 40 years, the first free elections since Patrice Lumumba, the great independence hero, had been elected and then been assassinated with you know, Western complicity. And, uh, and just after the election results were announced, I was trapped. Uh, I had gone to visit an Indian businessman in uh, a Unilever factory. And uh, uh, I was trapped because a, a street battle broke out. And so I was trapped there for three days. And I couldn't get out. My passport, my Indian passport, was back on the other side of town. And I called the AP editor. And I said, you know, I'm stuck. And it's the third day. People are going to get hungry. And I'm in a factory full of food. So they're going to come here. So can you, can you get me out? And he said, no, no, I can't do anything. And I called all the embassies. I remember the Indian embassy said, uh, uh, what the, uh, we have you in our register, but we can't do anything for you. The, the only thing we can do is inform your parents when you're dead, and we can help them <laughs> repatriate your body, you know, if they'll pay. And that's all we can do. And it was only the French embassy that said, you know, we're, we're going to get our, our citizens near you, and if you're on the way, we'll come and pick you up. So let us know where you are, give us your number. And th those are the only soldiers who said I could get out, but yeah. Yeah, so uh, well, I, I was a young reporter once and in Cambodia, and I'd gone to the Indian ambassador's 
residents to just have a chat. That's when India was refurbishing Angkor Wat, the temples at that time, right? And so he said, what brings you here? He thought I was doing a story on culture and, you know, the temple. I said, well, there's a lot of corrupt corruption by a Malaysian businessman here called Tan Lip, Tan, uh, Tan Lip Chong, that's the name, right? So I said, that those are the rumors and I'm here to do the story. And he actually said, Are Baba, why are you doing such stories? I said, why? He said, you'll get arrested and I'll have to get you out. So, so it's not always that, you know, the foreign services has your back. I mean, that's something we need to keep in mind. And this is what happens when you're, when you're in the string. And it's a very important thing to note that a lot of people have see stringers at the bottom of the hierarchy, but actually they are doing some of the most important. They are the initial witnesses. It's only when it gets really, really bad and that the, the you know, the big Western or, you know, classic a foreign correspondent turns up for the last three days before the change in power and, and they end up getting all the bylines but the bulk of the solid work is done by people like the way he was and the way he still is. So it's something worth noting in that how, how they operate. Uh, tell me now moving from there to Kigali and you know your favorite politician in the world Paul Kagame who is very fond of you I believe he's so fond of you he doesn't want you to come anymore. <laughs> tell us about that. <laughs> so yeah until until this year so my I lived in Kigali for about five years and I published a book on Rwanda called Bad News. It's outside, it's a yellow book. Uh, it's about it's the story, I went there to teach a class of a Rwandan journalists, print journalists, about 12 reporters. And as I was teaching them, they were taken out one by one. So one of my colleagues was shot dead on the day he criticized Paul Kagame. Uh, two others were imprisoned for criticizing him. Two others had to flee the country uh, fearing for their lives. And one of my students I hid in my home and I helped him get out of the country. And so the book is really about their stories. Um, so if Stringer is about my coming of age, you know, becoming a journalist and trying to understand in Congo, that's the previous book, what, what makes the news and what doesn't make the news because I was trying to survive by selling the news and often my stories were re rejected by my editors. And so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story of coming of age and survival but also meditation on what, what the news is, the colonial structures in news, what, you know, and, and the stories that don't make the news, that's the book. And in, in Bad News, the Rwanda book, is really just telling the story of these 12 Rwandan journalists but also the destruction of the free press in Rwanda and what a country feels like and sounds like when the free press is being suppressed and destroyed uh, through the story because a lot of these journalists in Rwanda who have been um, attacked or killed, their names can't even be spoken. You know, they're, uh, they're seen as enemies of the state. And so at the end of the book, I have a list of about 70 reporters, Rwandan reporters, uh, you know, who, their names, who they worked for, what happened to them, where they dis disappeared, where they were killed, you know, uh, and, and it, it's in some way to pay homage to their brave work because Rwanda is, you know, a bit of history. In 1994, uh, experienced a, a terrible genocide where, you know, uh, the Tutsi population was targeted and nearly a million Tutsis were killed. Uh, and uh, a lot of people believe that Rwanda is still living, you know, in the trauma, in the shadow of the trauma of that genocide. And so they're happy with the dictatorship today because the dictatorship provides, you know, roads and schools and so on, but it's not true. Uh, a lot of Rwandans have paid the ultimate price for standing up to the president. And really, I, I learned Personally, uh, all my books are memoirs, and so you know, it's through my eyes, through my journey, I was privileged to stand, to walk with these Rwandan journalists as they risked everything. As a foreign reporter, I could leave. The government would throw me out at worst. You know, they, they would likely not kill me. But the Rwandan reporters risked everything: their families, their lives, their wealth, uh, you know, their land, uh, their children, their bank loans. Everything is in the country, and so to criticize the government is an enormous risk and so I had the privilege of walking with them, they allowed me into their world and I learned more from those journalists, those brave journalists in Rwanda, uh, you know, uh, holding their government accountable than I, I can say from, you know, my Pulitzer Prize winning friends and so on. It, it, it was incredible to, on the front lines doing the real work of journalism which is to hold power accountable. If we're not doing that, then I don't, I don't know what journalism is. Journalism also in, entertains, informs, but the first job is to hold power accountable. No, it's that old adage, right? <laughs> it is that old adage, news, it, well, news is what someone somewhere is suppressing, the rest is advertising. And I think that's, that's what it is, yeah. Um, and to, to, but, you know, let's stay a minute with Kagame because he's the darling of the West, hmm. right? People call him the Lee Kuan Yew of Africa and stuff like that. Um, and obviously he has a personal history which is that, you know, he was part of the 
Patriot Front, and then they came back, and you know, after the 19 and the killings of the two, uh, the, the two assassinations of the two presidents, and, and the story that follows from that. But one thing, I was in Kigali last year. He couldn't come because I was going there with a, with a human rights NGO as, a, as an observer to the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. He wanted to come in as a journalist. He was not allowed. We did issue a statement supporting Anjan, but of course, statements are just statements. Nothing happened. But I still remember at that time, Rwandan government was very upset that you wanted to come, and you and, and your colleague, there were two of you who were in that list, who, who did, could not come. And they actually complained to the Commonwealth Secretary that why is it that a Commonwealth meeting here has to talk about Rwandan affairs? And the peculiarity that for those of you who are familiar with the Commonwealth is that it is an institution which brings together former British colonies. And Rwanda is not even a former British colony to start with. They've started expanding in and into making it to like a global development organization, which, which is a curious experiment. But I'm just curious, why is it that Kagame has this hold? Why is he liked so much? And why should we wary of messias like that? Well, um I mean, I can tell you, uh, the last year when I applied to go, that was the first time I even dared to think of going back. Uh -huh. Because when my book, Bad News, came out, and I spoke about the book of the Committee to Protect Journalists in New York City, uh, NYPD counterterrorism showed up at my talk with weapons. And I, uh, and I recently found out that my life was actually uh, in danger at that event. And they didn't tell me at the time. I asked them, why are you here? And they said, well, we have, uh, we have uh, information. And um, when, I, when I taught later that year in, uh, in England, I was teaching at uh, Brockwood Park at Krishnamurti School. Two Scotland Yard agents showed up at my school, and they sat me down and said, you know, we put your landline in your apartment on our hotline. And if anything happens, just dial this number 112 or something. And uh, you don't have to say a word. We know what the Rwandan government does, how they operate. Uh, you don't have to say a word, we'll come and get you. And so you just have to dial the number. Uh, and, and so uh, and this is what the Rwandan government is capable of. This is why we need to be afraid because they're not only going after journalists within the country, they're not afraid to go after reporters and academics outside the country. I've had friends in, you know, in the States and Canada uh, be threatened or their children be threatened even. And the reason, I mean, to answer your question, I, I think there's a the short answer to it, why does Kagame, why is he so popular? I think there's a worldwide movement, a post-colonial movement. There are countries like India, like Turkey, like Rwanda, are, are looking to craft a new identity, are looking to shake off the West. And they're looking to, uh, they're looking to their past. You know, what is our history, pre-colonial history? What can we draw on to craft our identity? And there's such a hunger for these narratives, for a sense of pride about who we are, that a lot of people in these countries are willing to overlook the crimes in Kagame's cases, like hundreds of thousands of people possibly killed, murdered by his forces. But people are willing to overlook their crimes because there's such a hunger for leaders who stand up to the West, who say, you know, we are a proud nation. And so uh, I wrote a piece this year in the New York Times and it went on the front page. And a lot of people, a lot of pro-Kagame uh, reporters and academics were really angry with me. Mm. But I really believe that that's the, we're at a unique moment in history and I understand, I truly understand both sides. You know, the, we need to hold these powers accountable, these presidents accountable, these dictators. But I also understand this need to shake the West and sort of craft some sense of, you know, what, what does it mean to be Indian or what does it mean to be Rwandan or Turkish? So, so that's the very, I'm bound to stay on that. I'm jumping my question order on, on this because I did want to ask you and I mentioned that to you yesterday. Because typically these conflicts are written about by journalists from the West, usually white men, right? But um, increasingly, what you have done with these three books, uh, looking at Africa, or looking at what Rajiv Chandrasekharan did with you know, the imperial Emerald City, the, 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 the imperial something palace in the Emerald City, which is about the green zone in Baghdad. Um, and then there are two other neighbor, neighborly books are by Rohini Mohan and Saman Subramaniam, both from India, who have written about Sri Lanka. Uh, very, very moving books. So you have things like that that are happening, where the gaze is no longer of the Western reporter, but someone who has had a shared colonial past, but does not accept the nonsense that comes from these governments, saying that we are always the victims and they're always the poet. Tell me a bit more about that. How so, do you look at, which is different from, say, the way a typical Western war correspondent would? So I think, I mean, uh, there's much to criticize about the media, right? We're in a moment where, you know, there's fake news and all this stuff, uh, you know, the media is being held accountable. I think that's important. Uh, the way the world is portrayed, as you rightly point out, is largely Western. Uh, my point of view on that is that 
we've come to a point where, a moment in history where countries like India, Nigeria, South Africa are wealthy. They have, uh, you know, uh, uh, large media scenes, they have a burgeoning economy. So why aren't these countries reporting on their neighbors? Why does news from Cambodia have to travel to London before it comes to India? Why does news from the Central African Republic, where I was there, have to go to New York before it comes to Nigeria? It doesn't make sense to me. So we can keep criticizing the West, and of course the West has its blind spots and its problems and you know colonialities about the way news is delivered and produced, but, and we don't have that, so why, why don't, why don't Global South countries, to you know, call them that. Why doesn't India report on the world? Why don't we have a global perspective? So, you know, China has started doing that with the China Daily. India has the WION. In the non-aligned news pool was there. There was Tanyuk, the Yugoslav agency in the former Yugoslavia. They've all tried doing that. But we all know that there are propaganda sheets. I mean, you know, they ultimately end up writing and crafting narratives which are not news news and, and and that's one problem i think that we are facing here that you know it's a it's a kind of you know talking back but without you know necessarily but at the same time hiding your own own inadequacies let's put it that way and i think you know as uh, you know as an indian correspondent for example in rwanda you you mentioned rwanda when i was traveling around the country I would go to all these places where I shouldn't have been, and so some government official would come and ask me, you know, who are you? And I'd say, oh, I'm from India. They're like, you're for, here for business, right? I'm like, yeah. And so they, they could not imagine that an Indian person would be interested in human rights. Yeah. So it served me well. And I think, you know, we have access to places, we have access to, and I don't think a Western white male reporter could have gotten away quite so easily, would have had to explain a little bit more. You know, they would have been a bit more suspicious, but with me, they didn't, they didn't have a clue. And so we have access to spaces and stories that other reporters don't have, so we, we can tell these stories. So, so my fun story of that kind is that I was working with Amnesty International at that time, and I was in Bosnia, uh, post-conflict, post of course, in the early 2000s, and everyone there thought I was from the UN. <laughs> if I'm an Indian in Bosnia, I could only be there. So I would say, Amnesty, oh, it's like the UN. No, I said, yeah, it's an international organization, <laughs> I would say, and then carried on what I wanted to do after that. So, yeah, so you, we have, all have to play our roles. A, a different story is that I have a friend I, I, I can name him, Michael Sheridan, he's a British journalist, and he had managed to get into North Korea about 15 years ago, and it claimed to be a school teacher, right? And he met a British diplomat there. He said, Michael, what are you doing here? And he knew that his cover would get blown. He said, oh, you think I'm Michael Sheridan? You know, everyone thinks that, who is this Michael Sheridan? <laughs> And the diplomat was smart enough to realize that he's on an undercover mission for Sunday Times. They said, oh, I'm, I'm mistaken. There's somebody I know called Michael, and he exactly looks like you. They said, yeah, I know these things happen. And, and that's, so <laughs> the, all kinds of fun stories tend to happen in, in this kind of a situation. So now, in, I think this was in Stringer that you have this very powerful set of conversations, and I wanted to stay with that, where you make a very strong point about how easy it is to identify a radio journalist because they have an equipment and they can be tracked and they can be attacked. Whereas the best tool that a reporter has is his notebook, as in this kind of notebook, not a notebook laptop, and, and a pen or pencil, right? And, and, and therefore, the witnessing that the journalist does as a reporter is different. Tell us a bit more about that. Oh, that was in bad news in the Rwanda book. Oh, bad book. news, sorry, yes. yeah. And so the point, I, the point I was making was because my reporters, the reporters I was teaching, the Rwandan journalists, were all print journalists. I wondered why they were being attacked. And I realized that you know, many revolutions in many bids for freedom across the world, whether it's, whether it's you know, uh, Samizdat underground newsletters in the Soviet Union or the Arab Spring, it's the written word that people use to spread the word. And the, why is that? Because the written word can be copied easily. Uh, it's anonymous. You can't tell who wrote it. Um, whereas a radio reporter, a friend had asked me, well, a colleague, had asked me why the radio reporters in Rwanda weren't attacked. And, well, the radio, you can recognize someone's voice. The radio is centralized. You destroy the antenna and the whole operation is broken. So it, uh, the print medium has a power, especially in, in a subversive context, that radio doesn't. And so it, there was just a reflection on why these radio, uh, why these print journalists in Rwanda were so important to the country, why the written word is so important. As a writer myself, I was wondering why, you know, why I was writing books, I was reflecting on that. So th there's a particular power that the written word has that I wanted to you know, emphasize and that these Rwandan journalists again taught me because they were being targeted more than anyone else in the country. 
Yeah, and it, there, there are two other um, observations that occur to me that Timothy Garton Ash in his uses of adversity talks about how dissidents in the old Soviet bloc Cold War period, they would exchange notes to each other in, in little pieces of paper with pencil, give it to each other, read, and then chew it and swallow it. And swallowing words took a very different meaning here uh, of, uh, you know, of making sure that you learned it and you knew it, but you left no trace of that writing. But then again, you know, I, I knew a Chinese dissident in Hong Kong, and, and I, you know, he spoke about this news being processed elsewhere and coming back, and that's when it occurred to me that I used to work for a magazine called Far Eastern Economic Review. Some of you might remember it. And um, we always used to joke, but far from where? <laughs> Because it was far from England, and we were based in Hong Kong. It was the heart of the Far East. Anyway, so but but the point point of that story that that dissident in China from China had told me is that when you can't believe the printed word, you believe the spoken word. Now that's a powerful image, but in this day and age, with the mistrust of news and the provision of pro provision of fake news, and we both have Indian heritage, we go back to India, and the spread of lies and half truths or fake news, whatever you call it, through WhatsApp and mediums like that. I mean, how do you, how can we tell apart what is an actual story that is witnessed in an unbiased manner versus a very motivated piece of disinformation or misinformation? Because it's so easy to create a scenario like a television studio, put on a flag jacket, stand in the middle of a board, and you know, the, Wag the Wagner and the Telegram channels in Russia are a great example of that. Right, now you have artificial intelligence and deep yeah. fakes and it's even more complicated, yeah. but you know, I think my response to that is to write in the first person. So journalism, I think the traditional journalistic traditions, I'll go, go into a little journalism speak uh, for a couple of minutes, but it, the traditional ju uh, journalistic form is ob to aspire to objectivity, to take yourself out of the story. And uh, in all my three books, I am the protagonist. It is written in the first person. I made these choice, this choice uh, explicitly to put forward my subjectivity. I'm not writing from an objective position. I don't think we can. Uh, we can maybe aspire to it in certain forms of journalism, and I do I, when I write for the New York Times or whoever. I do write in an objective way. But I also want to present who I am. I'm from India. You know, I'm, I'm a man. I'm brown. I grew up uh, in India. I grew up in Dubai. I went, I studied in the US. And so because of my upbringing and who I am, I ha I'm drawn to certain stories and I have certain blind spots. So I present this to the reader in the beginning and say to the reader, well, this is who I am, and if you want to come on this journey with me, then I, here's my invitation. But I'm not pretending to give you a complete and objective truth. And I don't want to because I don't think it's possible. And I think journalism would benefit from uh, sort of self-reflection in that way. Um, uh, I also like to start my books, journalist, journalism again, many books by foreign correspondents start from a position of authority. Often books begin, you know, I've been in Congo for two years or three years, let me tell you what it's like. And I like to begin my books from a position of ignorance. Mm. Because all the three countries I traveled through, Congo, Rwanda, and the Central African Republic, there was at some point at which I didn't know very much about the country. And so I like to start the story there. And again, I'm inviting the reader to sit on my shoulder and say, if you want to come on this journey where I learn, you can come and sit on my shoulder and we can go together and we can learn together. And obviously I, I'm in a privileged position. I can, you know, I'm gonna, maybe you can't leave your home, you have family, you have a job, but I, I have that luxury and I'm gonna travel through this country. So why don't we go and learn about this country together? And a third reason for writing in the first person, which I only realized recently, is you know there's a lot of talk now about PTSD and the you know the the toll this work takes and that's the subject of my new book Breakup the you know the toll it took on my marriage uh, on my relationship uh, I've realized that writing about myself and seeing myself as a character uh, allows me to process a lot of the emotions take some distance from it and allows me to continue this work. Uh, in a way that I might not be able to where I sort of, you know, fully immersed and not, not doing that processing. So I think it has many utilities to write in the first person to break this ideal and this tradition of journalism and that's what I've been trying to do, sort of not quite realizing that I was doing it in the first instance, but that's what I've been doing in the three books. Yeah, no, I do want to come to break up and we will in a moment, but before we do that, I mean, one of the things that strikes me, having read two and a half of your books, as it were, is the whole idea or the whole notion that you do place yourself at the center, but it's as a curious observer and with a sense of humility to, and I'm not saying this to make you feel good, I mean it, I genuinely mean it here, that with a sense of humility rather than this all-knowing air, that, you know, here I am, you know, this hotshot correspondent writing for, uh, New York Review of Books or wherever it is that the piece might appear, or Granta for that matter. And I think that's, uh, that's a very instructive thing because, again, that 
tone, otherwise, with, which is a very common trend in British journalism, where less so in American journalism, of placing yourself in the center, but as though, and then, you know, to for want of a better word, journalize, journalistically explain. I don't want to use mansplain here, but that's what I mean by that. That, you know, as a journalist, because it could be a woman who's a, who's a reporter also adopting the same kind of authorial air because she's writing about um, the other people and that otherization and all that. So that's, that's very interesting. But tell us about Central African Republic. I mean, why did that conflict draw you? You've already done DRC, you've done Rwanda, and Central African Republic is, you're right, it's a forgotten war, not known as a war. Most people can't point out, and there's a very wonderful line in the beginning, when you say, I'm going to the Central African Republic, someone says, which one? The, the yeah. editor asked, which Central African Republic? Which Central <laughs> African Republic, sorry, yeah, yeah. They didn't quite know it was the name of the country, they thought it was a region. But, I mean, to your point about put, placing myself at the center, so, you know, I did my PhD in post-colonial journalism, and something I realized when I was reviewing literature for the last hundred years in the journalistic tradition is that many foreign correspondents, for example, don't speak about the fixers and the local journalists mm -hmm. who help them. Yeah. And so you'll read some account, journalistic account in Zanzibar, you know, in the, in the conflict there in the 40s or whenever the conflict happened, in, I guess in the 60s, 50s and 60s, around independence. And... Uh, this foreign correspondent who just flew in from London will somehow make their way on some boat alone across to Zanzibar from Dar es Salaam. That would never happen. There was obviously a Tanzanian journalist there informing them, helping them, booking that trip, and telling them it was safe or not safe. And they've just been excluded from stories systematically. And so that's one way in Sometimes which... Sometimes for good reason, for protection and safety. Could yeah, be, could yeah. be, yes. Sometimes, but yeah. a, lot, a lot, it's because it's to place the foreign correspondent uh, very much like the colonial officer of old, yeah. you know, sent out from London or Paris to administer the territories and, you know, come back with treasures in, here in the form of stories uh, and become a hero back home. And so that's that tradition, colonial tradition, sort of transferred to journalism and meant that there was no space. Uh, my PhD advisor said, oh, maybe the narrative structure didn't allow for those, uh, those uh, local reporters to be mentioned, but you know, it wasn't true. It's, it's really to place the foreign correspondent at the center as like the hero uh, of the story. Uh, and so that's one way in which you, you can you know, share credit and, and show that you know, your work is important as a foreign correspondent, but you have a lot of privileges and you can also give credit to where it's due. But to your point about the Central African Republic, why did I go there? I was living in Rwanda. One of my closest friends at the time worked for Human Rights Watch, and he invited me on this trip, and so we began to con you know, construct this trip together. Uh, and uh, I guess what attracts me about these places, attracts me, is uh, they're not being written about. So these, these are some of the major wars of our time, and uh, there aren't foreign reporters uh, really reporting on these places. The, these stories aren't told. Human history is being unfolding in many of these places. And yet, they're, 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 they sort of lie on the margins. So my book, Breakup, uh, which was published this year, uh, is the first real mainstream account of this country in roughly 100 years. The last book about this country was written by you know mainstream account. Uh, I can name a couple. There, there was a comic book written by a Central African reporter uh, called House with, a Win with No Windows. There was another Battle for Bangui written by some South African journalists. But besides those, the last major sort of account of the country uh, was written by André Gide, uh, the Nobel Prize winner in 1927. It was called Voyage au Congo. And since then, there has been no you know, uh, mainstream account of this country. And so for me, publishing this book, this account of this journey that I made through, uh, I can describe a little bit, we had heard you know, rumors of uh, genocide happening in, this, uh, in the Central African Republic, that the Muslim population would, might be genocided. And so I traveled through and reported on the country in the three weeks before what ended up being an ethnic cleansing of Muslims in that country. And, yeah. yeah no, no. I'm told we have five more minutes, so I'm going to ask for questions, but I do want at the end for you to talk about what the title breakup means, and you can talk about the emotional toll, and we, we can talk about it at that time. But any questions? Yes, the gentleman in the center, and then Sanjoy, and, and, the, and the lady there. So those are the three. Can we take them in clusters? That's easier? Yeah. So the gentleman in the, yeah. yeah I think you need the microphone, right? I can, I can. Uh, if it's being recorded, then we need it. Let's put it that way. Okay, so challenge of speaking as an outsider. Yeah. Uh, the lady there? Do 
Yeah, popular films versus, yeah. And, and Sanjoy, yeah. Have you known fear? Okay. Yeah, so speaking as an outsider, film, popular film representation and fear. So yeah, so um, actually in the case of Rwanda, the, my position as an outsider is very easy to justify because many Rwandans, were they to write anything close to what I wrote, even if they were outside the country, their families would be in risk back home. So I can say things, so much of the book was driven, I can't go back to Rwanda, I lived there for five years, I have many close friends there, it felt like home, and I had to severe all those ties, all those friendships, and, but it felt worth it to me because I could say something that they can't. And I felt a responsibility to, be, to say it because I, my life wouldn't be in danger in quite the same way. Um, so in that case, I think you know, it, it, it's very clear being an outsider. I think films you know, like Blood Diamond or Hotel Rwanda, you can't ignore them because they've become part of the popular consciousness. And so when I'm writing my books or my stories, I'm very conscious that that's where the public might be, that might be their, the only thing they've heard about you know, regarding Rwanda. So I need to be conscious when I'm starting my story to meet them where they are. And so in, to that sense, in that sense, they are important and I can't ignore them. Um, and fear, I mean, you, yeah, of course you, I mean, uh, this work is about living with fear every day. It's just that you don't let the fear control you. Um, as a journalist, you have to be very humble to Salil's point. You know, you're traveling through these places, you're, uh, Typically, it works like this. I'll be you know, in Bangui, the capital of the Central African Republic. I'll hear about a massacre. I'll hear like some people died somewhere. But there's no real information. Nobody knows who did it, when, why, how many people were killed. And so that feels wrong to me. And so I, I begin to plan how I can get there. And I try to get as close as I can. But all along the way, I'm stopping at every town, every like, tea stall, every restaurant. I'm stopping, and I'm talking to people and asking them, is it safe to go on? And sometimes people will tell me, well, last night we heard a government convoy move, and so we wouldn't really go. And so then I'll wait. I'll stay three days there and see if it feels safe. But always have to be willing to turn back. And you can't be Rambo. You can't say, you know, I, I have to go on this mission and I'm going to go. You have to be very, very careful. And they know the terrain better than you. And again, to your question about, you know, being an outsider, this is... Uh, where, where you have to work together with local people and give credit to uh, the people in that area because they know their territory better than you. But as a foreigner, you have certain protections. Uh, people see you as a foreigner and, they, and you know, your job as a journalist is to bear witness, which is what Salil began with. And bearing witness has a power just by being present in these places. Perpetrators know they're being watched and they know they can't be as extreme in their violence as, as they might otherwise be. And so to do that work of showing up you have to rely on local partners, people along the way, people whose names you don't know, uh, and you're helped along the way. And you, you know, pay homage to these people in the stories, in the books you have space, in journalistic pieces you can't, but in books you can. You can write about the guy in the restaurant who was eating his you know, grilled meat who said, you know, don't go there and saved, saved our lives, or you know, who's, who, whose cousin was somewhere and said you can stay with us, and so helped us on our way. And, and just to give another example of that kind is in Indonesia, when Suharto fell, I was writing that story. And my editor, Nayan Chanda, some of you might know him as the last reporter who was in the Saigon presidential palace when um, the tanks came in. And his story was, he was still typing it on the telex machine. And the North Vietnamese came and cut it. And because he was an Indian, he was let go. Otherwise, God knows what would have happened to him. But Nayan told me at that time, you know, because I was with a photographer, and she was Chinese, Indonesian Chinese. And of course, in Suharto era, there was a lot of opposition to the Chinese community, historically, from 65 onwards. Uh, and they were seen as the beneficiaries of the system later. And um, Nayan, I still remember him on the phone telling me that, Salil, no story is worth your life. And the partner with you, she's an Indonesian Chinese. So don't go where you should not go. And I think that's something worth exactly as, as Anjan said, that there are stories, certain areas you just take very calculated risk. Break up if you want to say anything about that. I've said enough way, told, I, need, yeah. I, I saw some more hands up. Uh, uh, yeah, we can take, yeah. Yes, please. Did you have to learn all the local languages? And ah. So I speak French and uh, in, in much of Africa, you can get by with French and English. And now I'm working in Mexico, maybe I can say a few words. So I'm reporting on indigenous environmental defenders in, in, in Mexico. And the stunning statistic that drew me to Mexico is that 80% of the biodiversity we have in the world that's remaining is in the hands of, is being protected by 5% of the world's population, which identifies as indigenous. And uh, yeah. many of these indigenous people don't get uh, press coverage 
because of racism, because they're in remote areas, they're very poor. And so I'm traveling around Mexico with, and Mexico is the deadliest country for these defenders, 54 killed last year. Also the deadliest country for journalists, 22 killed last year. And so I'm traveling with a Mexican reporter and reporting on these communities and how they're, you know, fighting drone wars and fighting cartels to protect a mountain, river, forest. It feels like important stories on, on the environmental front lines, but they aren't being told. Yeah, and I'm told we have to stop. So I'm sorry about that. But we are both going to be outside signing books and happy to talk. Yeah, thank you.